Uh, there was a news article published this past week that caught my attention with its headline. The headline was this, <clears throat> 2017 was the world's most miserable year on record, study says. 2017 was the world's most miserable year on record. Uh, what do they mean by that? Well, uh, here's how the article begins. Last year was the world's most miserable for more than a decade, according to a survey of people's emotions in more than 145 countries. People experienced sadness, stress, worry, anger, and physical pain more frequently in 2017 than in previous years, according to Gallup's annual Global Emotions Report. The results mean the world is more negative than at any point since the polling company started this study in 2005. In a year dominated by war, political division, and humanitarian crises, nearly four in 10 people told pollsters, pollsters that they experienced stress or worry the previous day. One in five people reported feeling anger, while 23% experienced sadness, and 31% suffered physical pain. The title of most negative year in the negative experience index had been shared by 2015 and 2016 with scores of 28, but 2017 recorded a score of 30. The survey polled 154,000 people worldwide. Collectively, the world is more stressed, worried, sad, and in pain today than we've ever seen it, Mohammed S. Yunus Gallup's managing editor wrote in the report. Regardless of where a country may fall on the positive or negative experience indexes, or where it ranks in terms of specific positive or negative experiences, all leaders need to be monitoring the emotional temperature of the people they lead, he added. All leaders need to be monitoring the emotional temperature of the people they lead. Well, as we turn our attention to James this morning, I suppose that might be one way to describe what James is doing here at the beginning of his letter. In some ways, I suppose, you could say James is attempting to monitor and even direct the emotional temperature of the people he leads. Because the people to whom James writes would have certainly known something about the, the miseries and difficulties of life. Uh, because of the poverty and the, the persecution they face, they would, they would have known what it is to live through what they might very well have considered for themselves the most year, miserable year on record. To which we might very well respond, well, who doesn't know what that's like? I mean, life is hard every year. Every year is filled with difficulty and, and struggle. And that's just the way life is. You know, it's filled with challenges and, and trials that seem to, seem to never end. You know, just when you think you've gone through one difficulty and one trial, here comes another trial that you have to face. It's, it's never ending. And so even as Christians, it, it, it's never a question of will I face trials. It's almost always the question, how will I respond to the trials I face almost every day? And that's what James here in chapter 1 is concerned about. And remember that in this letter, James uh, provides us with a picture of what a real living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ looks like. And friends, the reality is that there are few things in life that will really test the veracity of our faith and that will really test whether or not we live by the beliefs we say we hold like trials. Right? Trials very often reveal the true condition of our hearts. And so James, out of love for these people who, whom he's trying to shepherd, he, he writes to them in order to help them respond well. To the trials that they're facing. So how does a, a living faith respond to the trials of life? Well, look at what James writes in the opening verse of this passage, verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now, admittedly, that's a difficult way to open a letter. That's a challenging way. Some people have been offended by the way that James has opened this letter. I mean, if you're sitting down with someone and they're sharing a difficulty in life with you, usually the first thing out of your mouth isn't going to be, well, rejoice. Why don't you just be joyful? I mean, you can even imagine those who receive this letter for the first time. You know, an elder in the church, perhaps, he, re he receives the letter. And the other people are there, well, we got a letter from James, what did he write? What, is he, what did he say to us? And as the elder is 
kind of reading it to himself, his face drops. In other words, let me, let me see that letter. Pulls it over, he's reading through it. What? What, what is James writing? He, he can't possibly mean this. Doesn't James know what we're going through? Uh, we had to flee Jerusalem because of persecution. We don't have any money. Uh, the rich here, they're, they're kicking us out of the homes that we have, which isn't much. How can he tell us to rejoice? I mean, it's hard to imagine that this went over well initially. Because listen, I think the challenge for many people with this opening verse is that they wrongly imagine that James is encouraging some sort of, some sort of glib response to the suffering of life. You know, as if he's denying the reality of the pain that's there. And saying that we should, we should just pretend like everything's okay even though it's not. But friends, that's not what James is saying. That's not at all the kind of joy that James is talking about. I think one commentator I was reading captured well what it is that James is actually saying here, quote, James is talking about the kind of joy that's not a passing, frothy chuckle or smile, but the quiet, strong, constant feeding into the soul, a deep satisfaction knowing that there is a sovereign God who spends our sorrows carefully and well. It is the joy of believing Romans 8.28 that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him who have been called according to His purpose. James gives no glib command here. In fact, the very reason that James needs to, to say this is because this isn't the natural response that any of us have to trials. I mean, trials by definition are they're difficult, they're unpleasant, that's what makes them trials. We don't, we don't like them, they're, they're not fun. And so James isn't trying to, to sugarcoat that or to say that we, that we should love the pain or even seek it out. No, what he's saying is that even in the midst of the pain, the response of a living faith in a sovereign God is joy. Which means, friends, that what we need to do is we need to take the, the difficult situation we're walking through and actively and intentionally re-examine our trials and deliberately run them through the grid of what the Bible tells us about God. Right, it's, it's just what James is telling us here. We need to, we need to count them or, or consider them or, or reckon them not as good in themselves but as grounds for joy given all that we know about God. And note that James speaks here about trials of various kinds. Okay, so whatever trial you may be facing right now, big, small, life-threatening, just a nuisance, whatever trial is included in this. Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. Now again, this, this isn't the way that people normally respond to trials. So how do we do this? Well, I think the rest of this passage is actually intended to help us do just this, to respond with joy. Uh, one of the difficult things with the study of, of this letter, James, is, is trying to figure out how uh, different verses in this letter relate. Because at times, James just seems to jump from one topic to the next. You know, he, he, we sort of talked about this last week. It's kind of like a frequently asked questions of James, and he just jumps from one thing to the next. And even within this passage, it almost feels like you could isolate each of these, these different paragraphs that are there on your page, and you, you can just kind of preach on them by themselves. But because verse 2 deals with trials, and then verse 12 deals with trials, I think we're meant to understand and interpret all of these verses in light of that specific theme. And so what you can picture uh, James doing here with the rest of these verses is it, it, it's him sort of uh, reaching into his, his spirit-inspired toolbox and, and providing us with a number of tools in order to help us count it all joy when we meet trials of various kinds. Okay, so let's put these tools to use that James gives us. Number one, if we're going to respond to our trials with joy, the first tool James gives us is a right understanding of what it is that God intends to accomplish through our trials. The first tool is that James gives us a right understanding of what it is that God intends to accomplish through our trials. Look at what James goes on to say. Again, beginning at verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. 
and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I love those verses. These are some incredibly rich verses. I mean, just look at that last part again. Right? What God is ultimately going to accomplish in us is that he is going to make us perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Think of all the things that you lack right now. Physically, spiritually, emotionally. We live in a fallen world filled with sin. And Christ has come to redeem this world and to redeem his people. And he, he has saved us. He has accomplished that redemption. It is finished, but he is still doing work in us. And what James is saying is that one day God's going to bring you to a place where you are lacking nothing. And how's he going to get you there? Well, part of the way he's going to get you there is through your trials. Because trials, what they do is they test our faith. That's what James says here. They, they force us to deal with questions like, like do I really believe in God? And, and do I really trust Him? And do I really believe and think that He is good? Right? Trials force us to make a conclusion about those very matters. And so, and so they test our faith. And what happens, says James, is that is that, that then produces steadfastness. So in other words, when I, when, I, when I reaffirm my love for and, and when I reaffirm my trust in God and, and in His goodness, and, and when I do that even when it feels like it's the most miserable year ever, that equips us then to endure and persevere in our faith even more. And in such a way, listen, that it actually makes our faith even stronger. I think maybe the obvious uh, analogy to all this is, you know, maybe think physically. How do you go about conditioning yourself physically? You know, maybe in terms of weightlifting, right? What do you do to build muscle? Well, the way you build muscle is through, you know, you strain that muscle, you, you work it out. Uh, or think of it in terms of cardiovascular training. Uh, I used to play uh, soccer in high school, and uh, in a soccer game, of course, unless you're the goalie, you're, you're running endlessly. The goalie had the best, most lazy job. You're running all over the field. <clears throat> and so what do we do to get ourselves ready uh, and in physical condition for the games? Well, we'd run and practice far more than we'd ever run in the game. Uh, in fact, we'd run in practice until we puked. And that was actually the coach's goal. He wanted to see every player puking on the field, and we did, and it was painful. But it got us ready for the game. It made us able to, to better compete and have a chance to actually win the game. And that's what James is saying here. It, it, this word steadfast has this idea of, of carrying a, a heavy load for an extended period of time. And so James is telling us that we need to develop this kind of steadfastness so that we can keep going in our faith even as we face difficulties in our lives. And then, of course, what he's also saying is that those difficulties and trials actually help us to develop this kind of steadfastness that we need in our lives. Which means, friends, listen, each trial you face is actually preparing you for the next trial. I don't know if you see your trials that way. They're preparing you for what's next. Which means, I suppose, we should get used to trials because they're going to keep coming. But it also means that if we let them have their full effect, like James describes here, and if we don't just endure through one trial, but if we persevere until the very end of our lives, God will then have taken all of those trials and so shaped us and refined us that we will finally be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And the best way to understand what James means by that is with a simple phrase that we use quite often, Christ-likeness. It's to be made into the very image of Jesus Christ. God, God is making us like Jesus. That is the great work that God is doing in his children. He's, he's chiseling all of our lives and he's, he's refining us and he's, he's purifying our love for him. So that like Jesus, we, we won't be lacking in any holiness. And that like Jesus, we won't be lacking in any love for God. And like Jesus, we won't be lacking in any love for others. We will look like Christ, lacking nothing. Paul says something similar in Romans 5. We rejoice in our sufferings, says Paul, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. 
Actually, see what he's saying there. Right, Paul's talking about how suffering focuses our hope on God and in Him alone, and ultimately that will not disappoint. Or think about what Peter says in 1 Peter 1. I mean, the, it's amazing how consistent this is in the New Testament. Peter says, in this you rejoice, in your salvation you rejoice. Though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What a comforting promise that is for those who believe. It's a future in which our trials don't have the last word, but in which the best, the best is yet to come. Friend, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I want to be painfully clear, though, that I have, I have no such comfort for you in your trials. Your trials will never result in any praise or glory or honor before God. They are, at best, warnings and even precursors of the judgment that is to come, the judgment that is to come because you have rejected God. Friend, will you turn away from that wrath to come? You may think that life cannot get any worse it can. Flee from that wrath. Put your trust in Jesus. If you put your trust in Him as Lord and Savior, He will take all of those trials and He will beautifully shape them so that one day you will be lacking in nothing. And Christian friends, we must remember that God is not absent in our trials. He does not intend us evil either. Rather, He's our Heavenly Father who's adopted us into His family because He so loved us in Christ. And He's now lovingly working to accomplish His good purposes in our lives. You know, even in the Old Testament, think of Job and the, the immense number of trials that Job endured. We're, we're told that Satan couldn't even touch Job without God's permission. Why? Because God was going to work good through those trials and He was sovereign over it. Or think of Joseph and all the evil his brothers intended to do him. And what's that famous verse that Joseph says at the end of his ordeal? He says to his brothers, you meant this for evil, but God intended it for good. God is not absent in our trials, and He does not intend to do us evil in them. Rather, He's making us into the image of Jesus. And friends, is not the Lord Jesus beautiful and glorious? And so if you know that purpose that God has for you, then you have grounds for counting the various trials you meet as all joy. That's the first tool that James gives us. The second tool is this. If we're going to be able to count our trials as all joy, then we need to ask God for wisdom. We need to ask God for wisdom. This is what James goes on to say in verses 5 to 8. Look there, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So James began by instructing us to count it all joy when we meet trials of various kinds because of what God intends to accomplish in our lives. And now he's saying that if we're even going to do that, we need to ask God for help. And specifically, we need to ask God for wisdom. Wisdom to understand who He is and, and who we are and, and what it is that He's doing in our lives and this wisdom as to how it is that we're to live our lives as we face trials. And so we need to pray and ask. Ask Him for wisdom. And note the requirement, though, that's listed there. We need to ask in faith with no doubting. And James has some, some strident words here for doubters, doesn't he? tossed about, double-minded, unstable. <coughs> if you're familiar with the New Testament letter of Jude, <clears throat> in which we're instructed to have patience 
and mercy with those who doubt. James would seem to be saying something radically different than Jude. But, but there's a difference between the kind of person that Jude in Jude 22 has in mind who, who has genuine questions and who thus humbly wrestles with God about those questions. Kind of like we saw over the summer, if you were here with us, when we looked at Habakkuk. As he humbly and reverentially wrestled with God about questions. Right? There's, there's a difference between that kind of person and the person that James describes in verses 6 to 8. The person James describes in verses 6 to 8 is someone who, who doesn't even really believe in God. I mean, they may call out for help. But they don't actually believe with any certainty that God will answer. Or, or that he's even good. Or, for that matter, that praying to him will make any difference. I mean, they're just kind of hedging their bets. You know, they got they one foot in the world and maybe they'll throw one foot with God and see how it works out. So, so they have no real commitment to God. That's what James is saying. And thus they have no real interest in receiving wisdom from him and in humbling themselves under his word. No, they're, they're unstable, says James. Uh, they have no real commitment to him. Their, their commitments are all over the place. Uh, no more stability or, or purpose of direction than a wind-whipped wave, he says. I don't know if you watched any of the coverage from the hurricane this past week. Uh, I watch the Weather Channel nonstop when these storms come. I just find them fascinating. Uh, but if you saw any of that coverage, those waves, and, and the wind just whipping around, there's, there's no consistency to the wave. Sometimes they're going that direction, then sometimes they're going that direction. Sometimes they're up here, and then sometimes they're down here. And they're, they're just all over the place. And, and that's what James is saying. That's what it looks like to, to pray with doubt. Whereas to pray with faith is to have, have consistent, not, not perfect, but consistent confidence that God exists. And that He's good. And that He gives what He promises. And thus to pray with faith is to reflect our own true desire that we actually want to receive what God has promised to give us. And that's exactly what James reminds us of in verse 5. And friends, listen, you should just meditate on the two ways that James describes God in verse 5. God gives generously to all without reproach. Just meditate on those two things. God is a giving God. And He is generous in His giving. In fact, the word for generous, there is a word uh, that also means single-mindedness. And the idea seems to be that when, when God's giving to His children, he, he, He's not distracted by anything else. But he, He's actually doing exactly what He wants to do with a, a single-minded, generous focus. He's all in. He's all in with his children, giving them what they need. And, James tells us, that God gives without reproach. Meaning, he never makes us feel bad for coming in asking him to give what he has promised. You know, he never says things like, where you been? Day late, dollar short, you should have come here yesterday. I was here waiting for you. Why didn't you come ask me then? He doesn't say things like that. He doesn't say, I hope you're going to use what I'm giving you better than you did last time. You really blew it last time. He doesn't say things like that. He welcomes us into his presence. And he gives generously. He gives us the wisdom we need to face the trials that we are facing in our lives. If we will but ask him in faith. Friends, do you understand that when you pray that way, you bring so much glory to God. Because what you're saying is that you, you, you love Him. You're saying that you trust Him, that you trust that He is good. And in effect, what you're saying is that, is that He knows way more than you do. And so you're placing your life in His hands and receiving what He has for you, whatever that may be. You glorify God when you pray that way. And you especially do it when you pray that way publicly. Which is why, friends, every month we provide an opportunity for this church to meet together and do nothing but pray together. In fact, we'll meet this afternoon for one of our monthly prayer meetings. Will you come and pray with us? Will you come and glorify God by praying publicly in this way? It will bring Him honor and glory as we pray to our generous Heavenly Father. So what we've seen so far is that if we're going to count the various trials we meet as all joy, 
We need to know the good purposes that God has for us, but then we also need to pray and ask God for the wisdom to understand and live in light of those purposes. Which brings us then to the third tool that James gives us as we face trials. In verses 9 to 11, the tool that James gives us is a right kind of boasting. A right kind of boasting. Look at verse 9. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. I suppose maybe it's not immediately clear how these verses relate to what's going on and, and what we've been looking at so far in this passage, but, but here's what I think is going on. Uh, James has been describing trials, and of course many trials in life have to do with money. And, and biblically, being poor is certainly a trial, but being rich also presents its own trials. And thus Proverbs 30 says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. And so James here is drawing attention to, to what it is that we really value and boast in. Uh, this word boast in the Bible has the idea of what it is that we, that we glory in. Uh, what it is that we delight in. Or, or what it is that we value and, and consider to be our, our greatest treasure in life. And James is, is saying here that if we're going to be able to count the trials we meet as all joy, then we need to make sure we're, we're boasting in that which is truly lasting. And so the poor man is to, to boast in his exaltation, says James. In other words, the, the poor man, he may not have any material wealth and he may receive little recognition from this world, but he has Christ. And he knows God, and God knows him, and he is an inheritor of the eternal riches of Christ. That is to be his boast, his glory, his delight, his treasure, you see. And then, as far as the rich man goes, says James, he's to boast in his humiliation. And I think James probably has in mind here a Christian who's, who's wealthy, and thus he's saying to the rich Christian brother to, to remember that you're no more important in God's eyes than your brother who has little wealth. So make sure that you're not boasting in your riches, that which the, the world considers exalted, but boast in Christ, that which the world considers humiliation. Which means then that what James is doing, you see, is he, he's instructing both rich and poor Christians to see their lives in light of eternity and thus not to be driven by the wealth of this world which is fleeting. It, it fades away. It's gone when the sun comes up. But instead, both poor and rich are to boast in Christ as their greatest treasure. And if you do that, then you can endure every trial that comes your way. And you can continue to rejoice because what the trials will make crystal clear is just how glorious the eternal riches are that we have in Christ compared to all of the fleeting things of this life. So count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. One, by knowing God's good purposes for you. Two, by asking God for wisdom. Three, by boasting in Jesus Christ as your greatest treasure. And then fourth and finally, by looking forward to the reward to come. By looking forward to the reward to come. And here we come to the very final verse of this passage, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Sometimes Christians get concerned when you talk about the rewards to come, as if that's not a, a, a pure motivation. But that's precisely what James is doing here, isn't it? I mean, he's saying to keep going because even if you're, you're walking through trials right now, and, and listen, you may just be slogging through the muck right now, but even so, James is saying, keep your eye on the prize because there's a glorious golden crown of life that you will receive if you remain steadfast to the very end. And friends, do see here who the truly blessed person is. 
You know, the blessed person isn't necessarily the person who's healthy, wealthy, and carefree, as the false teachers of our day so often proclaim. No, the blessed person is the one who's actually bearing up under trials and hard times in this life, and yet all the while is remaining steadfast in their faith as they trust God, and who thus receive their blessings not in this life, but in the life to come. That is what it means to be blessed. Don't believe the false teachers who tell you otherwise. As some of you know, one of my favorite books is uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, there's a character in Bunyan's story called Mr. Standfast. It's, it's a great title for a character, Mr. Standfast. And at the end of the second part of Pilgrim's Progress, referring to the trials of his life as he comes to die, Mr. Standfast says, the waters indeed are to the palate bitter and to the stomach cold. Yet the thought of what I am going to and of the conduct that waits for me on the other side doth lie as a glowing coal at my heart. In other words, it warms my heart. It gives me joy even to think about that which is to come. I see myself now at the end of my journey. My toilsome days are ended I am going to see that head which was crowned with thorns and that face which was spit upon for me. In other words, I'm going to go see my Savior who himself endured hardship and trials and who did so for me. I have formerly lived by hearsay and faith, but now I go where I shall live by sight and shall be with him in whose company I delight myself. Friends, it may take some time to apply that perspective to your trials. But listen, you'll never be able to count them as all joy without this perspective of the reward and delight to come. So it may very well be that 2017 was the most miserable year ever for the most people throughout most of the world. But of course, we may also find that at the end of 2018, People identify a new year as the most miserable year ever. And indeed, at the end of every year, that may be precisely how people feel. Because that's how life is. It's faced with trials, big and small, that seem unrelenting. So let me ask you, as you think through the many trials that you will meet this week, maybe you're finding yourself in a difficult marriage, Maybe you're finding yourself at a difficult stage in parenting. What stage isn't difficult in parenting? Maybe you're experiencing disappointment within your job. Certain dreams that you had just aren't coming to fruition. As you think through the many trials that you will face this week, can you begin to apply these four tools? Because these are, are grounds for joy, even as you meet those trials. Right. There, there can be joy. But you're going to have to see that trial as the very means by which God is actively working to strengthen your faith so that one day you're going to look like Jesus. And you have to put your life in the Lord's good hands and ask for wisdom from God to face the trial that's before you because He will generously give it to you. And then you're going to have to, you have to regularly work for an eternal perspective that values Jesus as the greatest treasure so that you can hold loosely to all the things of this world. And you're going to have to set your gaze, not on the blessings of this life, but on that final reward that's promised to all those who love God and who have remained steadfast through the many trials of this life. Friends, those are the tools that you're going to have to apply if you're going to obey this command to count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. This is it. There's no other way to do it. These are the tools God's given you, but you have to put them to use. You know, I think when I was younger, I used to think that it would be great to do something amazing for the Lord in this world. You know, to accomplish great historic things. But the older I get, and I realize that I'm older than some of you and less old than others of you, but the older I get, 
the more it seems to me that perhaps just getting to the end is itself quite amazing. Just to keep loving God. To keep trusting Him. To keep believing in Him. To keep trusting that He is good. Just to get to the end loving the Lord. Friends, that in itself is no small thing. Let's pray. Father, we readily confess to you that we don't like trials and that we would prefer that they not come. But Father, we believe that you are good. We believe that you are sovereign. We believe that you have a purpose. And it's a wonderful purpose to make us into the image of Jesus. Father, give us confidence in you. Give us wisdom, we pray. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to be generous in your giving. Will you give to us richly, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.